In case any of you don't know me uh, or haven't seen me around, my name is Deacon Staling. I'm a transitional deacon here at the cathedral, uh, which means I will be a priest. Uh, I'm not one of the permanent deacons who are deacons forever, uh, but I will become, I will be ordained a priest. Uh, I actually, I've just received uh, my ordination date, January 25th of uh, this next year. So. So please come January 25th, 10 a.m. at Saint, the chapel of Saints Peter and Paul in the morning, 10 a.m. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's a Saturday. Tonight we're going to be talking about the incarnation. Um, it's actually one of my favorite subjects. Uh, I studied, uh, did a one semester of Christology, uh, beginning a, a license at the Lateran University in Rome just this last fall uh, before coming back uh, to do a pat what we call a pastoral year, spending more time in a parish. So uh, the incarnation Christology really is um, one, of my, one of my favorite aspects of theology. So if I get really technical, I'm sorry, but I really, get, I really like to get into some of the nitty gritty stuff. And I find it really, really fascinating. Uh, but before we begin, let's uh, open with a, a prayer um, and we'll pray the, the prayer that our Lord himself taught, the, using the words that he himself used. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So tonight we're going to talk about the Incarnation. Feel free to raise your hand if you've got any questions. If something that I've said doesn't make any sense, if I start speaking a foreign language, um, you know, whatever, say, whoa, go back. Um, I want to begin first with just a basic definition about what we're talking about. When I, what, do, what do we mean when we say the incarnation? Essentially, bare bones, the definition of the incarnation is that the Son of God assumed a human nature by his conception in a virgin, Mary, by the power of the Holy Spirit. As Jesus Christ, he is truly and completely both God and man. All we mean when we say, all we mean when we say the incarnation is that Jesus is truly became man. God became man. This is one of the, really one of the central mysteries of the faith, trying to understand how this took place. And there have been lots of fights over the understanding of, of the church on, on what the incarnation means. But it truly is one of, the, one of the central mysteries because so many things are dependent on the truth of this mystery. Um, soteriology, the, the study of how, we're, how we are saved, stems from our, our understanding of the incarnation. Mariology, the study of Mary, what we, the way we understand Mary is directly uh, involved in, in how we understand the incarnation. The notion of the Trinity itself is, you know, reliant on our understanding of the Incarnation. So we've got the Incarnation, God becoming man. But let's back up a little bit. Um, well, God, be, let, let me look at the, let's look at the word real quick. Incarnation, a good way to kind of look at this, if you break it down in, from the Latin, in carne meaning enfleshed becoming flesh oops is basically the the root of of the word so when we say incarnation the the becoming flesh of god now let's back up a little bit and ask well why did god have to become man why did he have to take on a human nature and become man. 
To understand that, we have to go all the way back to the beginning and look at Genesis. Now, with Genesis, and I've drawn this picture, the high schoolers will recognize this picture. Um, in the beginning, you know, we have we have creation. We talked a little bit, or you'll talked a little bit about creation last time. But basically, we have the, the account of Genesis. God creates the universe, creates a garden, puts man and woman in it. And everything is happiness and sunshine. There's unicorns, it's great. Everything is wonderful. Through the sin of man, through his free will, through his freely turning against the will of God, something incredible happens. And it's, it, it's truly indicative of, the, of the, the immense power that uh, free will has, you know, th that our free will has. What, yes? I'm just joking, but she shouldn't be wearing a dress for sure. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so through man's free will, something quite incredible happens. Basically, the whole order of the universe, the perfection of the universe, is kind of uh, is upheaved. What man living in harmony with himself, with his neighbor, with God, with nature, is now thrown into chaos. Sin enters the world. Death enters the world. Destruction, pain, suffering, all of these things enter the world. And there's a great rupture between God and man. This triangle is God, by the way. Sorry. Um, the Trinity. A um, little shorthand for, for God. There's a great rupture between God and man. Man has upset the order of the universe. There's also now a, a great, you know, a, a rupture between man and his neighbor. But then there's also a great rupture between man and himself. We call that, you know, these are all effects of original sin. One of these effects is concupiscence, but that's for another class. It's that desire, that, that tendency that we all have to do the absolute wrong thing, you know, all the time. You know, we, we want to do the right thing, but we, you know, are always leaning toward doing the wrong thing. That's concupiscence. So the unity, the harmony that existed is no longer existing. There's a great chasm. There's a great rupture between God and man. But in God's mercy, he makes a promise. He promises to give man a second chance, to send a savior to redeem mankind, to bridge that, unit, uh, bridge that gap. And that person that he sends, the Messiah, the Savior, is Jesus Christ, is who he promises to send. So we see this, and if we look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we see, it, we see the, the precursors of this. We see, um, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed you are above all cattle and above all wild animals. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat in the, all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This passage is what we call um, the, the proto-evangelium, the, the, the proto-gospel. It's the first inkling that we have of the coming of Christ, the first promise that God makes to Adam and Eve to send a savior, um, and there will be a struggle between this savior and the evil one. So that's, the, that's where, it, where it all begins. That's the first promise in the Old Testament of a savior. When we look at the rest of the Old Testament, really the, all of the Old Testament is, you know, a series of prophecies, a series of promises for the Messiah, the waiting of the Jewish people for that longed for Savior. Now, what they were expecting over time was uh, 
of the of the savior was a much more political figure. Uh, they were thinking, you know, um, in terms of, of a kingdom, establishing a kingdom, the promise of David uh, to set up a kingdom that will last forever. They're thinking of a permanent political structure. And so they're waiting for this savior to set up this kingdom, this, the kingdom of God on earth, uh, reuniting and restoring that connection between God and man. Now, what we get is something quite different um, and almost unlooked for, but we can see little hints at the coming of Christ and the, the true nature of what Christ would be in his coming. I'll get a little bit more into, the, into some of the uh, Old Testament um, here in a little bit. Uh, we'll look at some of the, the specifics of that. But eventually we get to the New Testament, all the Old Testament leading up to pointing toward that coming of the Savior to the incarnation, to the, the coming of the Savior as man. And we get to that, uh, in, we see that first in Luke. Um, <clears throat> Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How shall this be, since I have no husband? And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. This is the moment of the Incarnation. Um, I know, I, I think we often think of, oh, the, when we think of the Incarnation, we think of Christmas, we think of the birth of Christ. But really, the Incarnation, the moment of the Incarnation is the Annunciation the conception of Christ in the womb of Mary, his first enfleshment, his first becoming of flesh within the womb of the Virgin. <clears throat> we see in this as well that the incarnation is, is also the work of the whole Trinity. Um, with the incarnation, we see God the Father sending the angel to Mary to give the message. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit who overshadows her that he becomes flesh, that he becomes uh, conceived in her womb. There's an interesting little connection between this passage and the creation narrative. If you look at the Hebrew word, um, the, there, there's a similarity between the, the term that's used um, for overshadow. The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. It's the same verb that's used when God hovered over the waters and created as he created the, the world. So we see that the in the in the incarnation, it's not just the work of the second person of the Trinity, but it really is the work of the entire Trinity that's 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 acting within the uh, in the incarnation with with the event of the incarnation itself. Uh, are there any questions? Okay. Now, why did we need the incarnation? Why did God need to become enfleshed? Why did he have to become man in order to save us? You know, he could have, 
I guess if he'd wanted to snap his fingers and everything would be okay. Um, but he didn't. He chose to become man, to suffer and die, rise again in order to save us. So think, let's think about why. We'll, we'll get back, to, we'll get to a, a, a specific answer, I think, as we, as we go through some of the, the heresies and things. Mm -hmm. That's probably the reason. Mm -hmm. there, there are really, there are four, there are four main reasons that uh, the church talks about. Um, the first is that God comes to reconcile us to God. The, the whole is to bridge this gap, to, to bridge this gap between God and man, so to reconcile us, to save us. We, as, as finite creatures, as, as merely human creatures, cannot make a sufficient reparation to God for the sins that we've committed. We need only, we, we need something, we need a, a perfect sacrifice in order to, to repair the damage done by sin. Jesus became man offering himself becomes that perfect offering. And only he can restore that, uh, re restore that bond. We often, you know, our, our Lord is a, is a Lord of mercy. God is a merciful God, but God is also a, a God of, of perfect justice as well. When we think about, you know, when we do something wrong, we, we break, say we, you know, hit a baseball through a window it's not enough just to say, well, I'm sorry, and then go, go along our merry way. You know, sure, if the, the person is you know, really, really nice, they could say, oh, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. But for true justice to be paid, some reparation, we would have to pay for the damage done, try to replace the window. Well, we can't repair that damage ourselves from the sins that we've committed. We need a perfect offering, a perfect sacrifice in order to pay that what is due to God. Yes? So you're basically, so what you're saying is we have a bat, we have a ball, but there was no window before Christ to break. And then when we broke that. No, there was a window, and we broke it in paradise. Okay. There's no way, we don't have a job to make any money to pay it. We had no we had no ability to, to to fix it. But now after Christ, it's it's through Christ. He's the one that fixes that window, and we'll get into we'll get into a little bit more of that um, as we go on. <clears throat> Another reason for the incarnation really is to show the depth of God's love for us. Everything that God has done for us, you know, from the beginning, our own creation is really, it's out of love for his creatures. He didn't have to make us with free will. He could have created robots, you know, little uh, automatons, you know, that were perfect. But in doing so, we can't freely love God. If he, if he created perfect beings that, you know, loved him without... Um, or they couldn't love without that ability to choose against him. It, it requires free will for that love to be freely given. And so out of his own, again, out of his, his great love for us, out of the depth of his love, he sends himself in the second person of the Trinity uh, to redeem us. So he becomes man to show us the depth of love. And we turn to we can turn to Romans, uh, chapter five, verse eight. But God shows His love for us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Since therefore, since therefore we are now justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved, from, uh, saved by him from the wrath of God. It is, it is truly out of his great love that he sent his son to redeem us. The other re- another reason um, for the incarnation is to show us, to give us an example of how to live a holy life. So this is an example of holiness. We've screwed it up, you know, since the beginning of time. And we need an example. We need somebody to show us how it's done. He comes himself to be that example, to show us how to live, to show us how to truly love God uh, and, and neighbor. We'll get into a little bit more on the importance of all of these uh, as, we, as, we can, as we continue. Uh, if we look at Matthew, uh, chap- uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 11, 29 and 30, we kind of see a, a, a pointing, uh, pointing this aspect out, his example of holiness. Matthew 11, 29 and 30. Take up my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He shows us how to to live holiness, how to be holy, so that we can ultimately be redeemed by him and live in that perfect, uh, in heaven, in paradise with him again, to be united as it should have been from the beginning. And that leads me to the last, to the last reason for the incarnation, <clears throat> that the Son of God became man so that we might become God's adopted children as we participate in his own divine nature. When we're baptized, when we're brought into the body of Christ, we we die with him in baptism and are raised to new life with him in his own resurrection through the sacrament of baptism. That's why he came, in order to bring us into that divine life. Now we need help to continue to live in that divine life so that we can ultimately live forever within that divine life in paradise. But through baptism, through our entry into the church, we become his adopted children. In in actually in a relationship that's a little bit different, that's a little bit closer than it was even at the beginning. It's actually a better deal in heaven than it was in paradise. Even though everything was, there was perfect harmony, that adoption into the life of Christ, becoming adopted children, adopted sons and daughters, of the Lord is something that's new, that's offered through Christ, through his incarnation. Okay. Are there any questions? And we'll get into some more of this as we, like I said, as we go on. Okay, now we get into some nitty gritty stuff, the fun stuff. When we're talking about the incarnation, what we're talking about as well, incarnation and the nature of Christ, who Christ is, are, are, are linked very, very closely. We can't talk about the incarnation unless we talk about who Christ is. Um, so who is Christ? I gave you at the beginning that that very simple definition that he is the second person of the Trinity. He is God become man. This is what the church has always held, that he is both God and man. 
And this is muy importante. Because there have been times within the church where, where the understanding of this has been uh, not so strong. And there's been a development of this understanding. And it's gotten some people into trouble. And there's been lots of fighting. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm going to get into some heresies because I think it's, it's easier to sometimes understand a mystery like the Incarnation or, or any of the mysteries of the church uh, kind of in a, in a via negativa. It's, it's easier to understand what Christ is not rather than trying to understand the mystery of what he is, what, what, this, uh, what this being both God and man, this is, this is called the hypostatic union. union for your, you know, 20 cent word of the day. But how do we understand this? Well, there have been some, some misunderstandings um, throughout, the his, the, throughout the history of, of the church. The church only ever comes down on people, you know, on, on heretics, we could say, um, when you step outside of this, of this realm, it kind of sets up the parameters. Jesus Christ is truly, is fully God and fully man. And you're free to investigate and write and within those parameters. When you step outside of that, that's when the church says, whoa now, hold up. So there's a couple of ways in which, major ways in which this has been kind of denied. So the first way, um, is to deny that Christ was not fully human. And we'll talk about the problems that all of these that these bring up here in a little bit. What's the name of that one? Uh, well, there are several um, different flavors of it. So, you, so the the heresy that that Jesus Christ really wasn't human; that God came with some kind of spiritual body mask thing that wasn't truly, it wasn't a human body, it wasn't a true flesh and blood body the way you and I have a body. Um, you have Gnostics in the, f the first two century, uh, Gnosticism. So he was basically a spirit with a, a fake body. You also have Manichaeanism. Yeah, um, Saint Augustine got into a little bit of that. He dabbled a bit, um, got his head, you know, screwed on straight. There, the the big thing with the Manichaeans um, is um, they denied the goodness of they they saw physical reality, nature, um, matter as something evil and to be avoided. So they therefore would say, well, God couldn't have you know, taken on something that was evil and, and bad. So they denied that he was, you know, he really wasn't human, that he was, he was God with a, with, a fake, with a fake body. Or, sorry, this is not human at all. That it's just God, sorry. Then there's the not fully human. Um... These, these get a little bit more technical. So you've got Apollinarianism, named after Apollinarius. Um, he was one of the, he was actually one of the, the early, not a father of the church, but one of the, the early theologians that I, I really got into within, within this first, first semester of Christology. He kind of got a bum rap, you know, uh, at this time, in these early centuries, the language that was used to talk about Christ was very vague. We, hadn't, we didn't have these definitions that we'll see later through the councils. The councils created these, uh, these definitions laying out, okay, this is what, through apostolic tradition, through the scripture, what we believe, what we've held um, in, a, in a more specific formula. So he's thinking... You know, he's thinking about the topic, trying to understand who Christ is, but he gets it wrong. Um, what he said, what Apollinarianism said, is that it was a, it was a human body. 
was a human body, but instead of having a human soul, God sort of, the, the logos, the word of God, kind of took over a human body, kind of invasion of the body snatchers kind of thing going on. Um, and so the, the church said, no, he's, in order to be fully human, he has to have both a fully human body and a fully human soul. Um, so that's Apollinarianism. So uh, a body, a body with a divine person as the soul. Um, there was another one that said that had to do with the will of of Christ, the the mono. Uh, monothelitism uh, that he had no human will that he only had a divine will so it was a human person but instead of you know our, our own human will he only had the divine will so that, uh, that that was a little more minor heresy so these are the ones that you know said he wasn't human at all that he was just God and then well he was man and or or he was God and sort of man. But the church, in, uh, through the council of uh, Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, um, said no, fully God, fully man. And we'll see why. Then there are, there are two other branches of heresies that would say that he's not fully, that he's not divine, that Jesus is not divine, that he wasn't God. First, uh, you have uh, Ebionism, Adoptionism, uh, and uh, Monarchism. Um, adoptionism and Monarchism. Now, again, remember the, the terminology being used is, is very imprecise and people are fighting in Greek and Latin and the w words that they're using to translate are not you know, exact. So they don't really understand. They're, they're really kind of talking past each other in a lot of ways. Um, but adoptionism said, well, Jesus was just a man and then at his baptism, where you have the great theophany, the, the heavens opening up and the Lord saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, listen to him. What the adoptionists say is at that moment he becomes the Messiah. He's adopted in to that role. But before that he was just a holy man. So that's, that's out. Um, it's right out. Um, Monarchism, monarchism kind of, um, you, you get kind of the word, you see the word monarch in that. What, uh, it really arose uh, with Jewish populations. In order, they, they really had a hard time with the whole notion of the Trinity. Um, and they're trying to protect the oneness of God. And so they are, they're not really ready to say that Jesus Christ was God. God is one. This whole one in three persons thing is, is really a big struggle for them. So, and you see a lot of this. Even some of, the, even some of the church fathers, some of the saints, have a little strain of this monarchism kind of running through them. Uh, again, we're dealing with people that did not have the the benefit of council doctrines, of definitions, of a common vocabulary yet. And we'll talk a little bit more about, we'll talk about the vocabulary here in a second. Then we get probably the, the strongest um, movements, oh sorry, one more, sorry, one more uh, here. You also have modalism, Modalism it, it kind of falls under this. What they say, what, what the modalists say, the Sibelists say is that God is one, but he has three masks. 
they 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 talk about modes or masks. So when he's created, so at some point, sometimes he's using the the God the Father mask. Sometimes he's using God the Son mask, and other times he's using the Holy Spirit mask. Uh, but it's just one, and he's kind of tricky and lying to us a little bit. Um, so that's out. Um, the last one and the biggest one, and uh, the handouts that y'all have tonight, uh, is the one on Athanasius really kind of hits at this, um, was Arianism. And the, the Arians basically say that Christ was the first created being and is elevated is a very important being, but is just a creature. Um, this actually, this uh, Arianism was the reason that uh, the Nicene Council was called, because a majority of the bishops in the church were pretty much Arian. Um, they almost won out at, Ni at Nicaea, but if you read in, your, uh, in the packet, uh, at, when you go home, you'll see that Athanasius, he was an awesome dude. He uh, he pretty much stood up for the the orthodox uh, understanding that no Christ truly was God, and won over uh, bishops and and eventually prevailed within that within that council. But it wasn't looking good for a while. This actually still exists. Does anybody think of what the uh, um, what Arianism played out looks like? Um, we, you see you see a little bit of, of it in, in Jehovah's Witness. Um, there's <clears throat> oh, where is that? Yeah, so. You have the Jehovah's Witness, which are modern Arians. Also, really, when you look at it, um, Islam is a branch, kind of a takeoff of this idea that Jesus really was just a creature like anybody else. So denying the divinity of Christ. And then finally, so you have not divine at all and then not fully divine. It's it's through a mis the, you know a misreading of certain passages of scripture. Um, there are certain philosophical kind of underpinnings that are going that are becoming popular that are that are shaping these uh, these thoughts. Um, you know, I, I think part of it can be you know attributed to uh, the the work of the diabolic. I mean, there there's all sorts of forces um, at work. There's influences from other. Uh, other religious groups that are kind of creeping in. Um, really, when we think about when we think about the, the fact of the incarnation, that God became man, God who is infinite, who is you know all powerful, becoming man, it's kind of a hard thing to swallow. It's kind of a scandal, in many ways, that you know, God, the creator of the universe becomes an infant, becomes a child, lives and dies, and then, is and then rises from the dead. But, but the, the whole fact that God, I mean, it, it's, 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 you have to have a little bit of, of sympathy for them. Again, they're not working with uh, an, established, um, an established vocabulary, an established understanding. They're still working these things out. And it's, you know, denying the divinity of Christ is, is I think, the easier of the options to, to fall into because of the, the pure scandal of it, you know, just that the God would become man, that he would, 
you know, kind of debase himself in that way. So then you, you have the, the last set of heresies that I'm going to talk about are the ones that would claim that God is not fully divine. Um, you have subordinationism or the semiarians, not the seminarians, but semiarians. They would say that, that Jesus is some, some sort of demigod, that he's somewhere halfway in between. Um, not fully God, he's sort of like God, but not quite God, but he's definitely, you know, somewhere greater than man, but less than God kind of thing. Um, you get some weird mixtures, he's, you know, that he's this other, just this completely other thing. Um, you get Nestorianism. Nestorianism is basically saying that God has, that it's actually two persons, the human Jesus and the second person of the Trinity that are united um, and just kind of have, you know, occupying the same space and always in agreement. Um, and so we would say, no, that's not, it's just one person. So that's out. Nestorianism is also, um, uh, you read, you, you get into Nestorianism when you start talking about Mariology. And um, have y'all done any class? Have y'all talked about Mary yet? You're probably a little later. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you get into Nestorianism. He he um, he divide, he because of this, because of his uh, Nestorius's belief that God, that Jesus was not fully divine, that he had there was a human person and a divine person. He therefore denied that Mary was the mother of God. He de he de he denied that Mary was the Theotokos. It's, it's a logical you know extension of of this thinking. Um, but he was wrong. <laughs> there's a, there's a, I forget where it's at. It's in a, it's in a church in, so it's a Carmelite, I think it actually, it's a Carmelite monastery in, it's in Israel. And I've, there's this great fresco on the wall. And, and I forget which, which saint it was that, you know, kind of did battle with uh, Nestorius, but th they've got Nestorius painted in this in this fresco as this snake. This is a snake with the head of Nestorius being stepped on by this this saint that uh, refuted him. Um, it was fun, fun fun stuff to look at. Um, so we have we have these notions of of uh, these incorrect notions that God is that, that Jesus is not divine that he's sort of not divine, that he's not human, that he's sort of not human. So what does the church say? What do we say? No, God is truly God, or Jesus is truly God and truly man. He is the second person of the Trinity. Yeah, I already got that. The second person of the Trinity that becomes man. Now, when we get into the, when we look at this, what, is that, what does that really mean? Now, we already said that it's not two persons. It's not a man Jesus and uh, a God Jesus, but it's one person with two natures. A human and a divine nature. The human nature is not lost you know, is not swallowed up by the divine nature, and the divine nature is not lessened in any way by the human nature. Now, this is weird because, and this is what we this is what we call the hypostatic union. This is weird because everything else has, you know, one person, one nature. You, I, we all have one nature. We have a human nature. When I uh, and we're, we're one person, we're one, an individual substance, uh, one substance, 
of a rational nature. That's the definition of a person of rational nature. But Jesus Christ, in some mysterious way, and this is where the whole mystery of it, has two natures. Wrap your head around that one. Um, so uh, let me read real quickly. This is from the Council of um, Chalcedon, if I can find it. Do, 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 do. <clears throat> so Chalcedon was really one of the last, one of the last major Christological councils, uh, kind of just wrapping all this up. So he says. <clears throat> Following, therefore, the Holy Fathers, we unanim unanimously teach that the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, is one and the same, the same perfect divinity, the same perfect, uh, the same perfect in divinity, the same perfect in humanity, true God and true man, consisting of a rational soul and a body, consubstantial with the Father, of the same substance with the Father, in divinity, and consubstantial of the same substance in his, with us in humanity, in all things like us, without, but without sin. Now, why does it matter? We go through the, these little kind of these, these nitty gritty details of, you know, two natures, one person. Does it really matter? And that's true. Let's think about for a moment that the claim of the claims that Christ made. What are some of the claims that Christ made? Well, you know, first of all, he made the claim that he was God, um, but he also promises us several things. He promises us salvation. He promises us salvation, redemption, eternal life. And how is he supposed to, you know, or how is he supposed to, you know, fulfill these 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 obligations? Well, he can't unless he is both fully human and fully, and fully divine. So, for instance, if he's not fully human, if we take one of those, one of those heresies that, God, that Jesus Christ really wasn't man, how could the sacrifice offered by him do us any good? It was mankind, it was the sin of Adam that lost paradise for all of humanity. And it's only through the sacrifice of a human being, of man, that that justice, that sacrifice can be paid, that that debt can be paid. If God himself, you know, just says, oh, well, I'll just, you know, erase it, it's we have a term for that. It's called cheap grace. It's cheap. It, it's cheap grace. It truly, it, what it is, is it's denying the, the the justice of God. So, in order, for, you know, man fell, and man needs to man fell, and then man needs to repair the damage. So he has to be man. Jesus Christ has to be human. He has to have that human nature, otherwise it does us no good. On the other side, the flip side of the coin though is, man cannot redeem himself. He cannot offer 
that perfect sacrifice needed. Only God can, can offer Only God can offer that perfect sacrifice. So he has to be God. Otherwise, it's just another person offering an imperfect sacrifice for the redemption of the whole world. I'm not that good. <laughs> I can't do it. You can't do it. We cannot redeem ourselves. Only God can redeem us. Only he can offer that perfect sacrifice. So Jesus Christ has to be fully human and fully God. Otherwise, it just does us no good. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Concerns, cries of heresy. Okay, with all of this in mind, and I think I lost, yep, lost the, lost the battery. Um, with all this in mind, I want to turn into Scripture a little bit more and look at, you know, okay, so the church has declared all of this, you know, God, truly man, truly, truly God, truly man, Jesus, truly God, truly man. Well, where do they come up with it? It's, it is actually scriptural, and we'll look at that, uh, where we can find these things, where we can find evidence of the divinity of, of God, of, of Jesus, in the, in the Gospels, um, in the other New Testament writings, um, and we're going to be running out of time. Um, so we'll go through these fairly quickly. Um, Jesus makes use of the title, Son of Man. We hear that all the times in the Gospels. The Son of Man. The Son of Man, um, my son, your sins are forgiven, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I say to you, rise, take up your pallet, and walk. This is Mark 2, uh, verse uh, 5 through 12. This Son of Man title is really a title from the Old Testament. And... Uh, uh, he, he, he is equating himself with God. In the Old Testament, the Son of Man, uh, it's from the book of Daniel that it's, that it's coming from. It's what he's referring to when he's saying, I am the Son of Man. Uh, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. It's a, it's a, this is, these are statements of divine filiation and equality with God. Um, usually when he, when he states, makes these statements about being the Son of Man, um, they're usually, you know, about, there are several uh, cases where they're about to stone him for blasphemy because these are, these are uh, extremely, you know, for the Jews, to, for somebody to be claiming these, making these claims is, is quite scandalous. Um, <clears throat> if we look at the prologue of John, so the first chapter of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. These, uh, this is one of you know, the quintessential um, passages that, that really points to the divinity of Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the words, Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Um, he goes on, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld this glory, glory as, only the, as, the glory as of the only Son from the Father. 
you know, clearly a statement of the divinity of Christ. Um, we see in the letters of Paul, uh, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at. This really sums up the whole the whole Christological mystery that that Jesus was with God. He pre-existed with God as the second person of the Trinity, became man. He did not uh, count equality something uh, with God something to be grasped at, but rather emptied himself and took the form of a slave. Simultaneously, we have the, both the divinity and his humanity. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of other examples that are really kind of interesting examples. Um, in the Old Testament, when Moses was on the mountain, being, you know, talking to God, God gave him a name to use. Yes, who should I say sent me? The, the, the Jews actually will never pronounce this, and I don't like to pronounce it either. Um, they use the term Adonai, uh, Lord. But it translates, it's, it means I am. There's a passage in the Garden of Gethsemane, or in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before Jesus is, um, is captured, before he's, before he's arrested. They ask, are you, uh, are you Jesus of Nazareth? And the Lord responds, I am. And the soldiers fall on their face. And he, he's, he's, uh, Christ identifies himself with this I am several times. Um, again, a clear indication that he is equating himself with Yahweh, with Adonai, with the Lord, with the Tetragamatron. Um, so the, the, the case for his divinity is, is very, very clear. Um, sorry. Uh, are there any questions? A lot of stuff, a lot of kind of nitty-gritty, a lot of um, somewhat problematic things that, you know, some difficult things to understand. Yes. When we look at, again, when we get into, what we take from that is we're, what we're looking at is the, the divine, this hypostatic union, trying to understand this hypostatic union. So we have, we have Christ, the one person, but he has a divine nature with a, with a divine will and intellect. and a human nature also with a divine will and intellect. Because he has two wills, what he's, when, he's, when he's saying something like this, the, the, the taking on these more subordinate phrases, using these subordinate um, um, uh, passages, we would understand him referring to that, that human will. His will, because the divine will, the divine will is the same. It's, it's all the same divine will as the, fa the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all, uh, the three persons of the Trinity are all going to have the same will because they're all one God, it's Holy Spirit. So their will 
is this, is this same divine will. So what it is is this subordination of the human will to the divine will within himself, freely done by him. We see, you know, uh, if we look at the, the temptations of Christ, without this human will, if he only had a divine will, the temptations would be nothing, would mean nothing. He would have never, had to, he would have never suffered um, or lived through these, the, the temptations, the same temptations that we live through. So it really, this, this, the human will is conforming itself to the divine will. This is also the same reason why we could say, why we read in, um, in uh, forget where it's at, um, after, it's after the, uh, the finding of Jesus in the temple. It says he grew in knowledge and wisdom. Well, he's got a, he's got a divine intellect. Shouldn't he know everything immediately? And you get people argue, you get theologians arguing about what Jesus, did Jesus know the score of the Cowboys game on Sunday? Seminarians argue about that stuff. Um, uh, takes a special kind. Um, but, but so when we, when we read those passages, he grew, in into, he grew in knowledge and understanding. What it's referring to here is the, the, the human intellect. He still had to grow. He still had to take, you know, learn human language the same way that we all do. He had to learn how to walk the same way we all do because he truly had that human will. Now, he did it a little better than us, you know, I don't think it took as many times, as many repetitions as it takes us uh, to learn that because of the, the divine and the, the divine intellect and the divine will. Does that kind of help answer your question? Yes, yes. That and then the, just the... Uh, Again, the, the, and the word was made flesh from the, the prologue of John. We see that the, the, the birth, uh, the conception through Mary, um, we, we, we draw that human nature from those passages as well. Mm-hmm. There are other kind of, um, there are moments where, you know, where th- this interplay between the divine will and the, the human will um, the, the divine and the, the, the human kind of manifest themselves. So, you know, all the miracles, uh, a human being, I, I cannot, you know, perform a miracle of my own volition. So it's the, it's the, divine, it's the divine nature acting with, through, the, through the, the, the human nature when he's, you know, when he's walking on water when he's um, uh, multiplying loaves and fishes, calming the storms. These are exercises of the divine, of the, of the d- manifestations of his divinity as well. We've got a couple more minutes. Are there any, any more other questions? My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? What he's, what he's doing there, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? It's not a cry of desperation for, for him himself. He's not despairing in that moment. What we have to do is look at, he's quoting scripture there. He's quoting the Psalms there. Uh, I th- think it's 88. Um, Psalm 88, I want to say, uh, 2022. Um, and what, if, if you read the whole, the entirety of this, it's, it's just one passage, but the Jews that were there at the crucifixion, when they heard this, it would have brought the entire psalm um, to them. It would have, it would have brought, the, it brought it to their attention. Um, and take a look at that real quick. My God, my God, why hast thou aban- why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? 
O my God, I cry by day, but thou dost not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet thou art holy, enthroned on the, pra on the praises of Israel, and, and thee our fathers trusted, they trusted, and, and thou didst deliver them. But I am a worm and no man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He committed his cause to the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet thou art he who took me from the womb. Thou didst keep me safe from my mother's breast. Upon thee I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, thou hast been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help me. So if you continue reading on, it's the beginning of a cry of great hope, a, a, a cry of, of, of actual um, trust in, in the Lord, and it's also calling out those who are mocking him, because in this psalm it is the just man who is being scorned and mocked and tortured. So it really is, it's a rebuke of those that have crucified him. They stare and they gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my uh, raiment they cast lots. But thou, Lord, be not far off. And just, it continues, you know, a beautiful, beautiful psalm. Okay. Who wrote that? I mean, it's, it's, it's psalms, I mean. Yeah, uh, traditionally we, we understand that it was David okay. that, that wrote the psalms. Okay. Um, you know, the, the serious scripture scholars, uh, they get into arguments about, you know, well, this comes from this source and that source, it, but it's beyond my, it, David, you know, David, for, and for the most part, there's no reason not to believe that David composed at least a goodly portion of the Psalms. Right. That's great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At that very moment, um, it's we really don't want to we don't want to separate the two because we when we start separating the two, it's um, it gets dangerous. It starts to lean towards some of these some of these heresies. So we don't ever want to say, well, okay, well he was acting through his his human will here, but he was acting through the the two wills were united. The, the two intellects were united in a mysterious way in that hypostatic union, which we, we really can't fathom. So we don't want it, to, it's better not to say, well, which, they're both, they're both operating. They're both operating. Obviously through, you know, through the, the miracles, you know, through the supernatural, it's obviously the, the divine will that's taking a little more precedence in those, in those moments. But it's it's not like a it's not like a possession or something like that you know where it completely takes the, the two the two natures are intimately united uh, one is not um, lessened at, at moments and it, they're still both operating. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 would, I would think so. I mean, it's, it's, it's a cry of agony, I mean, as well. I mean, he's, he's dying on the cross, um, and, you know, his, he is truly, you know, fully human. He's suffering. He's he's crying out in pain and you know he was you know completely immersed in the psalms immersed in the scriptures 
uh, he, he himself is the word. Um, so, you know, what better way to use, to express yourself, you know, he's than teaching, he's still teaching. And mm -hmm. verse 12 says, do not stay far from me for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, he's, I mean, it's, it's still, he's still showing us, you know, even in this small way, you know, how to, tr how to, to, to maintain trust in the Lord and how to, you know, he's rebuking as well those that are, that are crucifying and mocking him and dividing, you know, and part of it is, it, it's part of the, the fulfilling of the prophecies, you know, pointing to these, profo the, these prophecies, you know, they will, they will divide, they will cast lots and divide my cloak which happened, you know, th these are the same, the same prophecies that he's referring, that are actually being fulfilled at that moment. Any other questions? And it's 8 o'clock. <laughs> Nobody's going to ask any questions at 8 o'clock. <laughs> you all know better than that. Um, let's... Uh, one thing, one thing that I want to caution against is these things are important. These things that I've spoken of are important to understand, to have some grasp of. It's not necessarily the most important to understand, okay, well, what was Apollinarianism? And, you know, to understand and to meditate on the hypostatic union in, in, in its in its entirety on the, the fact that God became man is what's truly important. And the best way to do that is to just meditate on scriptures. Um, in particular, uh, let me give you a couple. Uh, the, the, the Christological hymns in Paul, I think, are, are excellent um, for this type of med uh, meditation. So uh, Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 through 11, though he was in the form of God. Um, Colossians 1, 15 through 17, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Um, sorry, uh, that's Colossians 1, 15 through 17 and, and following. Um, those are those are really good scriptures to meditate on, to take in, um, to try to understand, to the best of our ability, um, you know what this incarnation means, um, because it is difficult. Um, and I just covered you know a semester's worth of you know Christology in an hour. Um, so if you're a little confused, it's okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, um, but the, the, again, the basics, the basics are that, you know, the truths of the incarnation, that it is, is truly God, that Jesus Christ is truly God and truly man. And all of the other mysteries, the other truths of the faith really stem from that reality. Um, and, and so it is an important, it is an, a very important mystery to try to have some grasp of. So with that, let us close with a short prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all.